The most cited paper in NLP is Attention is All You Need by Vaswani et al, with over 110,000 citations at the time of recording this video, or also known as a paper that introduced the Transformers, and if you are watching this video, this is a good chance you've seen this paper already. My name is Bai, I'm a machine learning engineer and a PhD in natural language processing, and today I will cover the 10 most cited papers in the history of natural language processing. And more specifically, I will cover the 10 papers that have the most citations as of today on Google Scholar. And what surprised me the most was how old some of these ideas are. Not all of them are transformers or even use deep learning. So let's buckle up for a history lesson. The number one most cited paper is the Transformer paper, which came out in 2017. Attention is all you need. The Transformer was originally designed for machine translation, but after a few years, it became used everywhere, including in large language models. And it proposed the classic Transformer architecture that we all know and love today, including concepts like motor-headed attention and positional embeddings. What is really new about the self-attention mechanism in Transformers is it allows the model to process an entire sequence of text all at the same time. This was a major improvement over previous attention mechanisms, which only let the model look at one token at a time. Number two is LSTM, or Long Short-Term Memory, published in 1997. This is a fairly old paper, and it really only started gaining traction in the 2010s when people started using deep learning for natural language processing. The most popular architecture at that time for sequential data was the recurrent neural network. But this architecture suffers from training instability when you have long sequences, because information has to go through many layers before it can get to the output. This is called the exploding gradient problem, and causes problems when you're trying to train a model on long sequences. This paper proposes the LSTM unit, which is this complicated sequence of operations. But basically what it does is it gives this neural network some memory so it can remember things from previous steps. And it's easy to use as a drop-in whenever you're training a recurrent neural network. If you use a LSTM instead, it will usually do better. And that's why the LSTM became very popular in the 2010s. Number three on the list is BERT, which was published in 2019. The BERT model introduced the concept of pre-training followed by fine-tuning. What this means is during the pre-training phase, the model learns on a large amount of unlabeled text. So you can find a lot of data on the internet that the model can learn from. After the model has been pre-trained, they release a checkpoint, which then you can use to do your own fine-tuning on whatever task that you want to solve. And this you can do with a lot less data and compute. The fine-tuning process is very flexible, so you can take a pre-trained BERT checkpoint and fine-tune it in a lot of different ways, like for sentence classification or token tagging. Jumping to number four, we have a fairly old paper published in 2003 called Latent Dirichlet Allocation, or LDA for short. LDA is the algorithm that you use to train topic models. So a topic model is what you will use if you have a bunch of documents and you want to know what topics are they discussing. And this can be really useful in a bunch of fields like social sciences or marketing research. And the LDA model breaks down each document into a mixture of topics and breaks down each topic into a mixture of words. So for example, if you have some news articles about sports, um, you might want to break them down into ones that talk about soccer or basketball or maybe both. And this model automatically learns which words belong to which topics and also which documents have which topics. So quite a useful tool to have. Number five is word to vec published in 2013. The word to vec paper proposed to represent the meaning of words through lists of numbers, and these numbers are trained through data. And these vectors are useful for a lot of applications, and they also have some neat geometric properties, like for word analogies. Um, the vector distance between the vectors for men and women is similar to the vector between king and queen. Word to vec is trained using basically a two-layer neural network on a large amount of unlabeled data. There are two ways of doing this. Either you can predict the word given its surrounding words, called the continuous bag of words technique, or you can predict the surrounding words given a word, called the skipgram technique. 
And word 2 vec is arguably the first widely used application of neural networks to NLP. Number 6 is GLOVE, published in 2014. GLOVE stands for Global Vectors for Word Representation. And this is very similar to word 2 vec because it is also a technique to learn word vectors. But the way that this happens is kind of different. So word 2 vec uses a neural network to learn the word vectors, but GLOVE uses some linear algebra. With the GLOVE technique, you construct a big co-occurrence matrix where each row and each column is the count of how many times these pair of words occur together. With this matrix, you can apply a matrix factorization to derive a vector for each word. The technique is different, but the end result is pretty much the same, whether you train it with a neural network or with linear algebra. I'm going to skip past number 7 and go straight to number 8. You'll see why in just a minute. Number 8 is this paper published in 2014 that proposed to use RLN encoder decoders for machine translation. This is the architecture diagram taken from the original paper, but usually it's more common to see something like this. This model architecture uses RNNs to encode a sequence of words into a vector and then use this vector to decode uh, the output sequence. Previously, if you do not use this architecture, um, you can only use neural networks if you have a fixed dimension input and output. But this architecture allows you to have both the inputs and outputs to be sequences of any length you want. And they also discovered that the output of the encoder is a decent representation of the meaning of the input. Jumping back to number 7, we have the paper called Neural Machine Translation by Jointly Learning to Align and Translate. This is a paper that proposed the attention mechanism, so not the self-attention in the transformer architecture, uh, that's two years after this paper, but just the regular attention mechanism. Without attention in the encoder-decoder architecture, all of the information in the source sentence is encoded in a single vector, and this vector might not be enough to represent the entire meaning of the sentence. And the attention mechanism proposed in this paper allows for all of the encoder states to be accessible in each step of the decoder. This way you're not trying to squeeze all of the information in the whole input sequence into a single fixed length vector because you have access to the whole sequence in the decoder. So definitely a useful technique, especially for working with longer sequences. And this attention mechanism is one of the building blocks of the transformer architecture. Here is a visualization of the attention mechanism in a translation task from French to English. And what you notice is the phrase, the European economic area has a different word order in French, and this is learned here in the alignment between the two sentences that you can read from the attention mechanism. Number 9 is Blur, a method of automatic evaluation of machine translation, published in 2002. This paper is kind of different from all the ones we've seen so far. Instead of coming up with a new architecture, this paper proposes an evaluation metric, and it's mostly used for machine translation, but this can also be used whenever you're comparing two sentences for how similar they are to each other. For example, if you're given two sentences, then the blue score is always going to be a number between 0 and 1. And this is useful for evaluating translation and other types of generation systems. The method is not too complicated, it's basically a formula that counts how many different engrams from the candidate and reference sentences overlap. So it's a pretty simple paper, but it's one of the most widely used metrics in NLP. Finally, number 10 is the paper Sequence to Sequence Learning with Neural Networks, published in 2014. Actually, this paper is very similar to number 8. The two papers were published in the same year, 2014, uh, but by totally different teams. So I think these papers were done in parallel and independently came up with the same idea, which sometimes happens in academia. The biggest difference in this paper is they used a LSTM instead of an RNN, but other than that, the two papers are pretty similar. Um, since number 10 was basically a duplicate of number 8, I will give you a bonus one. Number 11 is WordNet, a lexical database for English, and this is the oldest paper that we have seen. WordNet is not a method or architecture, but it's a database. And you can think of it as a sort of dictionary that can be readable by computers. 
It basically categorizes all of the words in the English vocabulary that you will want a computer to understand. And it does so by grouping them into synsets, so sets of synonyms of words that mean similar things, like car and automobile, you can say are synonyms. And these synsets have relationships to each other, like a taxi is a type of car, that's a hypernym type of relationship. And it represents other types of relationships, like a book might have multiple chapters, and a chapter might have multiple pages, um, and so on. WordNet is a useful resource for a lot of NLP systems, especially rule-based systems that were common in the 1990s and the 2000s. And that wraps up basically my quick tour of the history of NLP. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything or any other topics that you would like to see covered in future videos. But other than that, if you made it this far, please give me a thumbs up, subscribe, and ring the bell icon to stay notified when I release future videos. Goodbye.